Welcome to my series of videos on mathematics for economists. In this video, I want to talk about determinants. But unlike in another video where I talked about determinants from a geometric point of view, here I want to talk about determinants from an analytic point of view. And I'm beginning with a definition of an object that is somewhat abstract and at first pass doesn't seem to have anything to do with determinants. Uh, this object is called an alternating multilinear form. But I'm going to explain by and by why this is actually exactly what we want to talk about when we talk about determinants. What is this? This is a function um, that has as the domain um, the Cartesian space of Rn repeated n times. Or in other words, Rn by n. Or in other words, we take n vectors of n entries each as arguments and we map just to a real number. Yeah? So again, we take n vectors of n entries each and we map to a real number f of v1 through vn, such that. Well, not surprisingly, two properties. One, f is multilinear. What does this mean? This means only that f is linear in each argument, plain and simple. So if we look at the mapping for each of the individual arguments, then this mapping is linear for all i from 1 through n. Two, f is alternating. What is this? If I have a repeated, very simple, if I have a repeated vector in the set of vectors, so one of my v1 through vn is actually just a repetition of another one in the same set, then the function value is zero. That's it. So let's write this down. If vi is equal to vj, for some pair i and j which are not the same, then f of v1, v2 through vn is equal to zero. Such a form is called alternating multilinear form. First fundamental observation about alternating multilinear forms. Let's take a system of vectors that is linearly dependent then I can write any vector, but let's, without loss of generality, assume the last one as a linear combination of the others. So the n minus 1 first. As a linear combination of the others. And this means that if I evaluate my alternating multilinear form, I can replace now the last vector with this linear combination, of course. And then I can apply linearity on the last argument here. So I get that this is the linear combination of the function values weighted by r, by the ri. But what are the function values? Well, now I get the vi here for i from 1 through n minus 1. And this means that I'm only repeating in the last entry the n minus 1 first. So for each single one of these terms, there's a repeated vector in the form. And then by alternation, this means that this is all 0. So uh, this means that uh, the multilinear alternating form on the 
a linearly dependent set of vectors is equal to zero. Well, remember from the video on the geometry of determinants that the determinant is a volume in here n-dimensional space. So it's an n-dimensional n-oriented volume. Um, so it is very natural to consider an alternating multilinear form to express this volume. Why? Well, if we want to, for example, stretch or shrink one of the sides of the geometric object that is spanned by the n vectors by a factor r, say, yeah, which can be larger than one, then we, we extend the, the length, or it can be less than one, then we shrink the length. Uh, what do we want? Uh, how do we want the volume to behave? Well, we want the volume to scale by the same factor, right? If we apply this factor to two sides, how do we want the volume to behave? Behave well. We want to have the volume scale by a factor of r square, right? and so on. So the multilinearity is a very natural property to define when you talk about a volume. Uh, what about the alternation? Well, the alternation, this comes back to the inside here uh, for linearly dependent systems. So let's, let's, let's say that we, that we look at three-dimensional space because we can somewhat uh, we can somewhat visualize what's going on. So we evaluate um, an alternating multilinear form on three vectors of three entries each. Uh, and now let's say that that v1, uh, let's say that v3 is equal to the specific linear combination v1 plus v2. So the system v1, v2, and v3 is linearly uh, dependent and in particular here, v1 and v2 span a two-dimensional subspace in three-dimensional space, or in other words, uh, this is a plane in three-dimensional space, and the third vector only lives on that plane. v1 plus v2 is a vector on the plane spanned by v1 and v2. It does not span a third dimension. The resulting volume of the object uh, v1, v2, and v1 plus v2 as the third vector is equal to zero because it is just a two-dimensional object and three-dimensional space, so it does not have three-dimensional volume. So formally, um, as we've seen above for the general n-dimensional case, this is what alternation delivers because uh, this is v1, v2, v1 plus v1, v2, v2, so we have repeated vectors in each form, and so the function value is equal to zero. And here we have the general n-dimensional case. Yeah? So in this case, uh, we're, looking at, we're looking for an n-dimensional volume, however, because the last vector is just a linear combination of the n minus 1 first, the resulting geometric object lives on an n minus 1 dimensional subspace of the n dimensional embedding space. And thus, whatever object is formed by these, by these, by this system of vectors, it is an n minus 1 dimensional object, and so it does not have n dimensional volume, and so the n dimensional volume is equal to 0. Good. Next, an alternating multilinear form is anti-symmetric. What does that mean? Let's look again at n-dimensional space, uh, three-dimensional space. And let's look at a system v1, v2, v3 of three vectors that are linearly independent. And now I'm evaluating this um, 
alternating multilinear form where I have uh, repeated entries in uh, positions one and three because I have I have uh, uh, plugged in uh, v1 plus v3 here. Uh, by alternation, the function value must equal zero because there's a repeated vector. And now I just apply multilinearity and I get a sum of v1, v2, v1 plus f of v1, v2, v3 plus f of v3, v2, v1 plus f of v3, v2, v3. And now by alternation, this one has a repeated vector, this one has a repeated vector, they are equal to zero. The resulting statement implies that if I switch vectors one and three with each other, I get minus the function value of the original sequence one, two, three. And this holds for, for all positions. I just took position one and three here for illustration. You can do this with one and two and two and three in a general and the n-dimensional uh, alternating multilinear form uh, with any two positions among the n. Uh, if you switch two vectors, you have to change the sign. Next important insight, adding a multiple of one vector to another, or in other words, perform uh, elementary row or column operations, does not change the value of the alternating multilinear form. Easily seen by the two properties. So we have to identify two vectors, position i and position k. And now I add a multiple of vector i to vector k. And then I apply first multilinearity in position k. R times f of v1 vi vi vn. And then I apply alternation. I have a repeated vector vi here, so this is equal to zero. So I get that I have not changed the original function value by adding the r multiple of vector i to vector k. Good. That's what I want to say about alternating multilinear forms. Now I want to move on and define my determinant on Rn by n. Remember that in the video on the geometry, we only got up to R2 by 2. How do I define the determinant on by n. I define this by picking a particular alternating multilinear form, the one that, well, it's a multilinear alternating form, so it maps from Rn by n to R, and it assigns to a set of n vectors of n entries each, a function value which I can now write as the determinant of v1 through vn. But I have to choose a particular one, so I choose the one that takes the value 1 on the set of standard basis vectors. In other words, the determinant of E1 
e2 pn is equal to 1. This particular alternating multilinear form is called the determinant on RNA. Yeah, and that's natural because uh, on the unit cube, of course, I want to have a volume of 1. Note that at this point we do not have an explicit formula for how to calculate a determinant given an n by n matrix or a set of n vectors of n entries. We only have two properties, multilinearity and alternation, sorry, and a third, uh, that it takes a value 1 on the set of unit vectors. So we can now just by using these properties derive a whole lot of properties of the determinant without having to know an explicit formula because it will turn out that the explicit formula actually looks a bit cumbersome um, but we don't need it for a while uh, in order to understand already a lot about the determinant one thing we can understand right off the bat and that is because we're talking all the time about a function that maps from a set of vectors to a number, and we have not said with a single word anything about whether these are column vectors or row vectors, in fact it doesn't matter, um, we can of course understand the set of vectors if we then collect it as for example the columns in a matrix uh, we're going to get an n by n matrix and that's standing right here that we're mapping from our n by n um, we can understand this 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 function to go from a from a set of matrices to the real numbers and we can understand these as the column vectors or we can understand these as the row vectors that form the matrix and this means um, and this is our our first property our first property is that the determinant of a matrix A so A being a matrix for example that consists of the vectors in the columns, the determinant of the matrix is equal to the determinant of the transpose matrix, where I have these vectors in the rows instead. If I don't say anything about vectors, I just write them down, I always understand them to be column vectors. If we now form a matrix B, that consists of our original vectors and then we have a multiple of vector i so we just shrink or extend one side of the object um, by a vector r or alternatively uh, if we have these vectors as row vectors and we extend or shrink the ith row by factor r then the resulting determinant of the matrix b is r times the determinant of matrix a and this follows directly from multilinearity of the alternating multilinear form by the same token, if we form B by multiplying every vector by a factor R, then the determinant of B is R to the power of n times the determinant of A. If I switch two vectors, so I form B as VI, excuse me, V1 
and then there's a VI, and then there's a VJ, but now I switch two, so I put VJ in place of VI, and do VI in place of VJ. Then it follows that the determinant of B by anti-symmetry is the negative determinant of A. If I um, add a multiple of one vector to another, I do not change the value of the alternating multilinear form. So if I add r times vj to vector i, then the determinant of B is still equal to the determinant of A. If I have a diagonal matrix that has these n diagonal entries, then I can write the determinant of this diagonal matrix as the determinant of t1 times the first standard basis vector, d2 times the second standard basis vector, and so on, dn times the nth standard basis vector, and now I can apply multilinearity. So this is d1 times the determinant of times the determinant of e1, d2, e2, da 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 D, N, E, N, and so on. So this is the product of the diagonal entries times the determinant of the standard basis, which we agreed is equal to 1. And thus, this is the product of the diagonal entries in the diagonal. very important, the determinant respects multiplica multiplication. I mean by that, that the determinant of A times B is the determinant of A times the determinant of B. Now, to understand this, uh, start with the special case that B is a diagonal matrix. Then the determinant of A times D is the determinant of A11, D1, A21, D1, da, 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 AN1, D1, A12, D2, A22, D2, da, 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 AN2, D2, and so on. A1N, DN, A2N, DN, ANN, DN. So this is the determinant of D1, A1, D2, A2, da, 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 Dn, An, where the Ai are the columns or the rows of A. Uh, oh, sorry, here's just the here's just the columns. Um, and so I can apply multilinearity in each argument, and I get that this is the product of the diagonal entries times the determinant of A1 through AN. So this is the determinant, as we have seen, of the diagonal matrix times the determinant of A.
that's in the special case where we have a diagonal matrix for the matrix B here. But uh, of course, we can now use column operations to change any given matrix B into a diagonal matrix D. And we know that column operations by property 4 here, column operations do not change the determinant. And thus, we can we can reduce every matrix product AB to the situation of a multiplication with a diagonal matrix without changing the value of the determinant. And so this argument actually already shows the statement that the determinant of the product is the product of the determinants. From this, we get property 7, um, the matrix, the determinant of the inverse matrix. So let A inverse be the inverse of A, then the determinant of the inverse matrix is 1 over the determinant of the matrix. And this is because the determinant of the identity matrix, which is the determinant of the set of standard basis vectors, is equal to 1. And this is by the definition of the of the inverse matrix, the determinant of the product of A inverse times A, or A times A inverse, doesn't matter. And this is the determinant of A inverse by our last properties times the determinant of A. And there you have it. Property 8. Uh, note that we're deriving all these properties just with those three properties of the determinant alternation, multilinearity, and value equal to 1 on the set of standard basis vectors or on the identity matrix. Property number 8. If we have a upper triangular matrix, lower triangular matrix. Then the determinant of A is still equal to just the product of the diagonal elements. And that's because we can, by way of elementary column operations, by adding by adding multiples of one column to another, or by adding multiples of one row to another, we can transform the upper or lower triangular matrix to a diagonal matrix. by column or row operations. Yeah, and these do not change the value of the determinant, and thus, uh, if we have a triangular matrix, the determinant is just given by the product of the diagonal entries. Final property. Let's uh, consider three matrices. B is Rm by M, C is Rn by N, and M is Rm by N. And we form a block matrix A that has the block B, M, 0, 
which is n by m, and c in its block positions. So the entire matrix here is of dimension n plus m by n plus m. Then the determinant of a is again equal to the product of the here not the diagonal entries but the determinants of the diagonal entries. So this is the determinant of b times the determinant of c. This is because we can write a, you can convince yourself that this is true, as the identity on m, 0, 0, c is, is a block matrix, times the identity on m times capital M, the matrix, in lowercase m by n, 0 and the identity on n times b, 0, 0, and the identity on n. And then we apply that the determinant of the product is the product of the determinants, and this here is a diagonal matrix. This is a diagonal times a diagonal and a block. And again, the third position, a diagonal and a block. OK, these nine properties are the consequence of our alternating and multilinear form. We do not have a, an explicit formula to calculate the determinant and the general case. So now is the time to work on that. So let's first start with the case 3 by 3. So now we're going to work on the explicit determinant formula. And we begin with the case 3 by 3. So we have a matrix A given by A11, A12, A13, A21, A22, A23, A31, A32, A33. And as before, we denote A sub i uh, for the columns. So this is a 1i, a 2i, a 3i columns of a. Then the determinant of a is the determinant of, well, let's just have a look at uh, the first column here. We can write this column as a11 times the first standard basis vector plus a21 times the second standard basis vector plus a31 times the third standard basis vector. And then we still have the second and third column standing here and I'm not doing anything with them. Now I use multilinearity. So this is a11 times the determinant of e1, a2, and a3, plus a21 times the determinant of e2, a2, and a3, plus a31 times the determinant of e3, a2, and a3. OK. Does this look like? This looks like A11 times the determinant of the matrix 1, 0, 0, that's E1, first standard basis vector, and then A12, A22, A32, A13, A23, A33, plus 
a to 1 times the determinant of second standard basis vector and these columns are the same. Plus, sorry, that was uh, a to 1, plus a31 times the determinant, oops, times the determinant of third standard basis vector, and these columns are the same. Now I look at the structure of these matrices that I have here, and I notice that I have, in the first matrix, I have a block matrix, where the blocks are a uh, one-by-one identity matrix, that's the, uh, just the number one, and a two-by-two two block. Um, in the second matrix, I can achieve the same structure, meaning the structure that I have a, a, a leading one and then a two-by-two two block by switching rows two and three and switching two vectors in my alternating multilinear form is going to give me a factor of minus one by anti-symmetry, which is a consequence of alternation. And in the third, so this is going to transform this matrix into a matrix of this uh, structure. And in order to achieve the same with the third matrix, to again get a structure where I have a where I have a leading one and then a two by two block matrix as a diagonal block matrix, I have to apply two switches. Uh, I first switch row two with row three. This gives me a factor of minus one, and then I switch row 1 with row 2, and this gives me another factor of minus 1 um, for a neutralization in the end effect. And so I can write this as a11 times the determinant of 1 is 1, times the determinant of this uh, block matrix here, which is, as we know, a22 a33 minus A23, A32. We know this from the video on the geometry of the determinant where we derived the 2 by 2 case. Um, now, plus A21 times the determinant of this matrix, but since I get a factor of minus here, I write now minus A21 times the determinant of the matrix. Now I switch row 1 and 2. 1, A22, A23, 0, A12, A13, 0, A32, A33. Plus A31, I get two factors of minus 1 for a total effect of plus a31 times the determinant of 1, 0, 0, now with the two row operations here, a32, a33, a12, a13, a22, a23. This is a11 times A22, A33 minus A23, A32 minus A21, now the determinant of this matrix is the determinant of a block matrix, so this is again 1, I'm going to leave that out now, A12, A33 minus A13, A Three two plus 
A31 times the determinant of this block matrix here, and this is A12, A23 minus A22, A3. So notice that the that the sign pattern that emerges is plus minus plus and so on minus plus minus so it's kind of a chessboard pattern of uh, of signs plus and minus and note that I can understand the let me scroll back here to to this picture. Um, I can understand the determinants that I'm the, the two by two determinants that I'm evaluating here by imagining that if I begin, I take the what do I have the whole matrix here? This is a good picture. This is a good picture to look at. If I begin. I take the first entry, A11, and multiply it with the determinant that I get if I delete the first row and the first column. Because then I get this 2 by 2 matrix here. Then I say, follow the chessboard pattern, minus A21, the position in the second row and first column, A21, times the determinant that results if I delete the second row and the first column which is the determinant of this 2 by 2 matrix. Right here. Then I follow the chessboard pattern again. I get plus here, plus the third entry in the first column times the determinant that results if I delete the third row and the first column, which would be this matrix here. And that's exactly what's standing there. Yeah. So we can write our explicit determinant formula for the general case exactly following this recipe. I calculate the determinant of a given n by n matrix by writing the sum. Oh, that's a bit sloppy from 1 through n. Now I have to take care of the chessboard pattern for the sign. I do this by writing the factor minus 1 to the power of i plus k. Yeah? So I start in row 1 and column 1, so it gives me a 1 plus 1, this is minus 1 to the power of 2, so the sign is positive. Here I get uh, row 1 and column 2, so this is minus 1 to the power of 3 is negative, and so on, so this works out, times the coefficient in position i and k, yeah, this is 1, 1, so this is the first, this is the first column here, 1, 1, 2, 1, and 3, 1. The entry in this position times the determinant of the matrix that results if I delete row i and column k. 
So A I K is matrix resulting from deletion of row I in column K. This is the column expansion of the determinant. And you can now imagine that if we have a 4x4 four four matrix and we follow the same recipe, then we're going to have a resulting 3x3 three three matrix to evaluate at each step. And then we have to go into the 3x3 three three matrix, apply the same idea, and so you get a recursive definition of the determinant. If we have a 5x5 five five matrix, we pick a column, we take the coefficients in the column, assign the appropriate uh, uh, sign, and then calculate the determinant of a resulting 4x4 uh, four four matrix. Yeah. We have to go into the 4x4 four four matrix, pick a column, take the coefficients, evaluate the determinant of a resulting 3x3 three three matrix, and so on. So, so the, the task can, be, can become quite daunting for large matrices. But this is the general formula for the column expansion. We can also expand by a row, because the determinant of a matrix is the same as the determinant of the transpose, and so um, we have, an, we have a, uh, an equivalent row expansion, and I'm going to write it down here if I can convince this tool to scroll. I'm going to write it down here. We have a row expansion. is not grabbing a row i and then I take the sum over the columns k and so again the sign pattern remains I take the positions in the row so I freeze a row i and then I go through the columns k and I evaluate the resulting matrix, the determinant of the resulting matrix if I delete row i and column k. Okay, let's do an example of a large matrix so that we can see how this works in action. Um, now of course, I cannot just do this in general because then uh, this video will, because the video is long as it is, but it's going to get extraordinarily long. Um, so uh, let's look at a at a matrix that has the following structure. Not n plus one, excuse me. I want to look at n minus one plus x. A n minus two. This is the first row of the matrix. A n minus three. Da da da. A one and a zero minus 1, x, 0, 0, 0. 0, minus 1, x, 0, 0. So you see the pattern that emerges. 0, 0, 0, x, 0, 0, 0, 0, minus 1, and x. Or, if you will, this is the matrix a n minus 1, a n minus 2, a n minus 3, a 1, a 0, minus 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, minus 1, 0, 0, 0. Zero, 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 minus one, and 
0 plus x times the identity. Yeah. Now we want to calculate the determinant of this matrix. This is an n by n matrix from we count it from 0 to n minus 1, so that's n. Um, but of course it has a very sparse structure. There are lots of zeros in here, and that's going to help us evaluating the determinant. So it's not going to be as much of a nightmare as it may look at offhand. So we expand the determinant along the first row. So what do we have to do? We have to keep in mind that we have a chessboard sign pattern, plus, minus, plus, a little bit. Um, and depending on what n is, we have, to, we have to figure out what the signs are here. Um, then we're going to take the coefficient in the corresponding position, uh, here 1, 1, delete the corresponding row and column, here first row and first column, and evaluate the matrix of the corresponding resulting n minus 1 by n minus 1 matrix that is left. And you can see here the sparsity makes this actually a diagonal matrix for which we can easily uh, evaluate the determinant. We can actually just by looking at it already understand that the determinant of this matrix is x to the power of n minus 1. Right? That's what we're going to do. Back. So, all right. So the determinant of A is first sign is plus a n minus one plus x times the determinant of the resulting matrix if I delete first column and first row. This is x zero 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 minus one x zero zero. 0, 0, x, 0, 0, 0, minus 1, x. And this is a diagonal matrix, and so the determinant is equal to x to the power of n minus 1. Now it's the first. Now the second. sign minus a n minus 2 times the determinant of the matrix minus 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, x, 0, 0, 0, 0, x, 0, 0, 0, minus 1, and x. And I realize I have this nice block structure again, where I have minus 1 and an n minus 2 by n minus 2 block matrix that is diagonal and has only x's. So this here is minus 1 times x to the power of n minus 2. Next, sign pattern plus a n minus 3 times the determinant if I delete the first row and third column, and this is the matrix minus 1, x, 0, 0, 0, 0, minus 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, x, 0, 0, zero, 
zero s zero 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 minus one and x. And now I realize again I have a block structure. I have a two by two block here that is diagonal. So the determinant is given by minus one to the power of two. And then I have a n minus three by n minus three block that is diagonal and only has axes on the on the diagonal. And so uh, this is minus one squared, so that's just a plus one, times x to the power n minus three. Now I continue like that, and then I get to the last position, and the last position, this is the nth column and the first row. The nth column and the first row. So I get the factor minus 1 times n column and first row times the coefficient a0 times the determinant of the matrix um, that arises when I delete the first row and the last, the nth column. And that's the matrix minus 1, x, 0, 0, 0, minus 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, minus 1, x, 0, 0, 0, minus 1. And this is an n minus 1 by n minus 1 matrix, and so uh, it is diagonal, so it is the, the, the determinant is simply equal to minus 1, the diagonal element, to the power of n minus 1, the dimension of the matrix. Now I can collect the determinant of A is equal to first term, A n minus 1 plus x times x to the power of n minus 1. Next. Minus minus gives plus, but I'm going to still write minus minus at first pass. A n minus 2 times x to the power of n minus minus a n minus 2 times minus x to the power of n minus 2. Third, a n minus 3 times minus 1 to the power of 2 times x to the power of minus n minus 3. And so on. Plus, last one, minus 1 to the power of n plus 1 times minus 1 to the power of n minus 1 times a0. What do we have? x to the power of n plus a n minus 1 to the power of x n minus 1 plus, which is minus minus, a n minus 2 times x to the power of n minus 2 plus a n minus 3 times x to the power of n minus 3 plus da 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 plus this of course is minus 1 to the power of 2n so this is an even number 2n so this is plus a0 that's a polynomial with coefficients a n minus 1 through a0 and so we see that polynomials generally can be understood as the determinant of this matrix where the
the volume that is spent in n-dimensional space by these columns depends on the unknown x that then serves as the argument for the polynomial. And so this is an example uh, how we can evaluate a large n by n matrix if the structure of the matrix uh, lends itself to this kind of expansion. Thanks for watching.